Hi, so um, today um, I have invited uh, Felipe Milanes uh, for an interview uh, to be launching the, the channel of the International Society for the Project Economics. And Felipe is a very good friend and he's a, a professor at UFBA, that is uh, the Federal University of Bahia in the northeast of, of Brazil. And um, well, the reason I invited uh, Felipe is, 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 um, is the, the current situation of, 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 of indigenous population in Brazil. Uh, yeah, I mean, not only, I mean, the, 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 the epidemic of, of COVID-19, but also <clears throat> uh, the threats that are related to, to to the expansion of, of mining and expansion of, of um, um, monocrops. And uh, in general, the threats they are facing uh, due to this, this dismantling of the environmental policy and, and land protection policies in, in Brazil. So it's a very serious situation. Um, and, especially well, in general for rural populations, but um, in particular for uh, indigenous communities. And then uh, Felipe is, has been studying and uh, has been learning from indigenous uh, uh, communities for a long time. And uh, he's, I think he has published recently a, a very nice paper that I recommend to all of you in world development about the effects of COVID-19 epidemic in the indigenous communities in Brazil. And that paper will be the core of our, our conversation uh, today. So thank you very much, Felipe. And, uh, well, I'm very glad you're here. And, and my first question to you is, is uh, well, what is your interpretation of what is going on in Brazil nowadays in the field of, of indigenous rights and, um, and the environment, biodiversity conservation in general. Well, first of all, thanks a lot, uh, Rodan, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here talking to you and uh, to the people uh, associated to the Society of Ecological Economics. Uh, you know, there are, and societies that are, I admire a lot and which I have learned a lot. Uh, during all my research training program in political ecology. Uh, we are living a very intense moment in Brazil, turbulent one, uh, a lot of upside down, up, uh, very good moments and very depressing moments in the same day, at the same time, in the same hour. Uh, sometimes wake up uh, with the horrible news that someone just passed away with COVID-19 or through other forms of violence. And then during the day, we hear some amazing news that like an indigenous leader just won an international award and is, is getting international recognition for her struggle, such as Alessandra Korap Munduruku. And, uh, and, one, and, and to me, the, maybe one of the best feelings that I have in this moment is, is that we are able to fight, we're able to keep struggling, we're able to think, to keep thinking, thinking together with indigenous leaders, thinking together with traditional local uh, leaders, uh, women's leaders of collective uh, uh, social movements of traditional populations, such as women's uh, uh, extractivists, uh, collectors in the Amazon, and uh, and we're being able to to enjoy a lot of exchange, and uh, this motivates and this engages me a lot. Uh, this helps me to understand that how the university is important and how to do research is important, so we can promote circular, we can produce new ideas, we can promote new ideas, we can circulate ideas. And, and, and I realized that this is part of the struggle. This is a revolutionary process. 
and uh, I'm I'm positioned in a very privileged way, privileged place in Brazil as well. Bahia is a wonderful state. I have a fantastic team of students working together with me here, indigenous students, indigenous artists. And, and so I'm very happy that we are able to move during one of the worst period in, of the history. Mm -hmm. So it's an intense and sad process, but we are able to fight. Uh, I, I would be feeling worse if we could not resist as we are resisting now. And then things can get worse in the next year or after. So I'm worried about that. But by that time, I'm enjoying trying to produce a lot, trying to listen a lot of stories, trying to help uh, indigenous friends to write their stories, to, to, to publish their, their, their testimonies, the, that they are, how they are uh, seeing and facing this process. Uh, we, we, uh, in, a, in, in a more general approach to the context of Brazil, uh, what we're seeing is that the worst backlash that we could imagine. Uh, we get like the worst of the militaries, like the ones who, who, who defend torture, the worst of the militaries from the dictatorship. They should be in jail that they're now back to power. And then we get the worst of the worst of, uh, of the latifundio, of terratenientes, of big ranchers, you know, that, that they have the same mentality of a plantation system. They have the same mentality of the, the big house, the Casa Grande. They, they, they have the same mentality during the slavery period here, pre-abolition. Uh, we have this, the worst of the Brazilian elite, with the worst of the militaries associated with international capital. And what, you, what makes the situation more depressing, maybe than in, in previous experience in the past, is that these groups, they have the support of a large part of the population. So it's not the, the genocide of indigenous people that we're watching today is, is committed by a minority in power. It is incentivated and, uh, and mobilized by a minority in power, but with the support of a huge part of the Brazilian population. Uh, of the majority, we cannot say that we are 70%. I disagree with this movement that's appearing in Brazil. We are not 70%, just like in US now that you see that's really tied, the, the fascists and who defends Trumps and, 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 and the ones who defends democracy that are supporting Biden. You know, I wouldn't support Biden. But right this, in this moment in that US is divided and Brazil is also divided. But the division here, means support the deforestation of the Amazon, support the killing of indigenous people. And this makes things very hard to debate and to disagree and try to discuss a future for, a common future for the world, for the country. You know? And in the sense that when we listen to the news of the fires and read the news of the fires in the Amazon, the fires in the Pantanal, that should touch everyone's heart, there are many people who support that. It's not only that they disagree as negationists, they support the fire. They believe that it's good for the economy. Uh, they support illegal mining in indigenous land. A, a huge part of the population is supporting all those crimes, believing that this is a way to, to make to, to find a job or to that's necessary for the economy. So this is, I would say, uh, not only the material level of destruction which is it's, it's rising the deforestation in the Amazon, Pantanal, and now Brazilian biomas, violence against the, the population, violence against environmentalists. I would put in the same side, the violence of the ideas is that th this maybe is one of the most depressed uh, part of Brazil today. But looking back, I mean, if we look at the recent history of Brazil, um, especially in the period, let's say, between 2000 and 2004, 13, 2012, uh, there was a combination of positive statistics in Brazil, and everybody was, I mean, outside Brazil was looking at it as, a, as an example of, you know, is, it was declining uh, deforestation, uh, it was declining inequality, 
um, millions of people were taken out of, of poverty. And um, the leadership of Lula was very impressive in, in Latin America and worldwide. Um, at the same time, many new indigenous land were decreed. And, and so the question is, could you foresee what, what is happening now at that time? And, and what is your interpretation? What, what happened? And what explains the rise of the extreme right in Brazil? What is, uh, what is it your interpretation about uh, so, so radical changes in a very short period of time? I remember a few years, of, uh, about 15 years ago, when I started to work in the Amazon, that you have this feeling of going to the frontier, uh, facing violent uh, adversaries, like uh, facing gunmen and uh, or grilleros, land grabbers, and then where, and 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 ranchers and illegal loggers. I mean, we could go to this place and investigate corruption, and then. As, as work, uh, working as journalists, as I, I used to do by that time, would publish an article that would, have, that would mobilize the public opinion against that. And, and, and the government should build a response to it, either sending the troops, the, the national forces, or I don't know, anything would be done. If, if, we, would, if we denounce that someone was receiving death threats, they, uh, the, the, the federal government, the state, would, would be pressured to, to act to protect that person. Uh, in many different ways, in many different sense, we had the feeling that things could be built. Uh, and it, it would depend in a matter of a political uh, debate. I mean, we could con convince people, we could produce knowledge that would inform the state, we could dispute parts of the state, but things could be built. We're building a country. We would building a. Uh, would would was we're trying to build something. For example, uh, the Brazilian Indian Agency that was very much uh, mobilized by the government of Lula and Dilma, and, and pressure to authorize all those big infrastructure projects in the Amazon. Even though we had always could have a very trustful dialogue with people working in the agency. Uh, we would trust the, 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 the employees of, of FUNAI or IBAMA, uh, and we, we could visibilize the, the, the external pressure uh, and, and denounce when something legal was being committed because we would we would defend what was legal, for example, you know? So we, we used to think that we could not build a big dam in the Amazon without having the, pro, the, the consultation process of the indigenous people affected by. And if we would face, if we, if we would find out that there was illegal mining uh, invading an indigenous land and would expose that to the press, then the government would react to that and to something. That even in the 90s or in the, or during Lula's and Dilma's, uh, it changed a lot when Bolsonaro reached power, defending what is illegal, defending the crime, having a direct association with militias, with private militias, with pistoleros, sicarios, gunmen, and defending the killing of the others, defending and promoting racism, then we didn't we just didn't know how to react once uh, people agrees with that. And it makes like absolute impossible to discuss the debate, how if someone defends torture, what, what can we say? If someone defends that it's right to invade indigenous land, destroy the rivers to extract fill gold, and killing the Indians, the Munduruku, the Kayapo, how can we react to that? This uh, in the in the past when we would have fires, the fire season in the Amazon, which does not exist, you know, the, there's no fire season in the Amazon. There's the dry season when you have less rain. But fires doesn't exist naturally in the Amazon. But when we would see fires there, uh, we try to build in institutions to, fa to, to, to deal with that. We try to build something with the Burma, try to find, to manage the fire, try to teach 
the indigenous group and helping them to fight fire or try to help uh, these small holders uh, to give more technology not to use fire. But right now, fire has been mobilized as a political action. So the rangers, they decide to put fire because they want to show power. They decide to destroy the forest just to show power and to show that we, we, we have conquered this land. Uh, it's something like the, the previous war of conquest that we had in the, in the 16th century. But now they're just, it's not only that they have, they, have, they have found new way for just wars, you know, to justify the wars against the environment. Is that they're really proud of that and they are making that their political agenda. And it's a new experience to do that. The US is facing the same, the same arguments, let's say, for the destruction of Alaska and all the natural resources in the US. But here is something very cruel. Once we know that it, in, in, on the, in the bottom, on the frontiers, people are being killed for that. And uh, uh, behind the fires, there are land grab. And then associated with land grab and deforestation, you have uh, death threats against environmental, uh, uh, popular environmentalists, uh, grassroots environmentalists, or the environmentalists of the poor who are defending the forest to live that. And, in my, in my position, I, re, I have contact with many of the, these people. They are, in many cases, are friends or work together. So I can get a, a WhatsApp message in the same day that, that uh, women received the death threats in the, uh, alongside the BR 163 in the Amazon. And then in the past, what I would do, maybe we'd go to the press, write an article in the press, and I would just don't know what to do. And this is really bad, we can mobilize uh, social network, social media, but then at the end, we don't know. Once everybody knows that this is an absurd and should and should have a, a, a response from the state, and the response does not come, it means that we have a bigger problem to face. We have a big political problem, which is not only it's happening in Brazil, but it's a political problem that can happen anywhere uh, in the world, and how we can come out without not only denouncing it as would be something uh, directly associated with something like uh, would be a, like a, a crime would be committed. So enforcing the law would be a solution. Now we have, once the government defends the crime and it, there's no more call for law enforcement from the state in the Amazon today, because Bolsonaro denies that. Uh, it comes out that you need to build real alternatives. We need to build new world. We need to transform the situation. We need to, to, to definitely face the real problems that we haven't done that before. Uh, the Brazilian fascists didn't come out from nowhere. When you talk to, the, to black people, to indigenous people, they always tell us, I mean, we were suffering that before. You whites are, were not paying attention on that. Uh, in my case, I was paying attention because mostly uh, because of my indigenous friends and fighting the, together with the indigenous struggles. So I, I knew that the situation was already very problematic. Uh, but in most of, most of uh, the Brazil that was dreaming to be a, a, the great Brazil or to become a powerful nation in the world, they were not paying attention of the contradictions of this process. And uh, and black people and indigenous people were trying to teach us that uh, uh, democracy was not uh, working in the past. And uh, if, if, if the, I believe that the fascism of Bolsonaro uh, is supported a lot through the, the, a very violent extraction of natural resources and the stigmatization of indigenous and black people in Brazil and Quilombo you know, uh, which are rural black communities. Uh, since previously to the campaign has been attacking indigenous people as, as, as Hitler would be doing with Jews in, the, in, 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 the, in Germany, because he was just fine that indigenous people were not a big country because of indigenous people, uh, because they were the obstacles of, the, of our progress, our. Uh, the indigenous people wanted to be like him and it would mean to extract niobium or, or gold. I mean, our, we would be rich if we could exploit the Amazon. This is a, 
this is a common uh, sense that Bolsonaro has been produced that my relatives in South Brazil, they believe in that. They are very much mobilized. They have become fascists and they are mobilized by Bolsonaro. So I have, I have cousins that they could dialogue a few years ago and suddenly, I don't know how they see me because we haven't talked for years, but as I can read what they post on social media, they don't trust in anything that, for example, I would write and I write for, you know, they don't trust that people are dying for COVID-19. They don't trust that deforestation is real. They don't trust that indigenous people still exist in Brazil. And so negationism, this uh, denying climate change, cl denying uh, that we are entering into a very painful and, and, and difficult time for the existence of humanity is something that dialogues directly with denying uh, democracy, denying the possibility to share the world, to, come, to, to share uh, things, you know. So uh, we have the economic crisis, we have a political crisis, we, have a, we had a coup in Brazil in 2016. We didn't enter fascism for nothing. There was a, a, it was a political project from Brazilian elite where, uh, by the Brazilian press that played a major role in the coup of 2016. We don't have freedom of press in Brazil because the press in Brazil is controlled by five families. So when you see Folha de São Paulo, Estado de São Paulo, Globo, it's not free press, you know, it's three families who are controlling what can be said, what can be uh, read. And, and these five, six families who control the press in Brazil, they have been mobilizing racism for years and years and years for this to, 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 pr to promote the ideology of, of the economic development through the exclusion of indigenous and blacks in Brazil. So the hate of indigenous people that Bolsonaro makes it as a political support today was, was already here in 2010 when Veja magazine and, and, and the Estado de São Paulo, a very important journal, Oro Globo, were against the demarcation of indigenous land during Lula. And they were claiming that demarcation of indigenous land would uh, economic, how do you say that? They would be economically impossible to, to, to uh, Brazil would, they would say that some states were in, inviable, uh, inviable, inviable. That was like, it would turn the country economically inviable. I mean, no, that, that's the point. That's what is economic, the future of, the, of our economy should be focused in protecting land and, and living together with, uh, with the forest of nature and not extracting, absolutely. Uh, so it didn't come from nowhere, but what, 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 what has changed and what is the worst is that the poor, uh, the oppressed people in Brazil, they have voted for the elite. To, to, to protect the privilege of the rich. And this is really sad. I think I believe that it's not, it's not that Lula was doing a great government. I'm very critical of him and even more of Dilma, but at least the poor were voting to protect their rights, their interests in somehow. And then suddenly they decided to vote to protect the rich. And they decided to vote to protect the killers of their group. And this is really, really sad. Now we, 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 we watch some indigenous people defending Bolsonaro, knowing that Bolsonaro is killing them. Uh, we're we're going to have elections in the 15 November, and there are some indigenous uh, uh, participants of this electoral process who are affiliated to the same parties as Bolsonaro. Same with uh, very few. Uh, Black people, very few, of course, is the minority of indigenous and, and blacks you know, who are supporting this movement, but they use that uh, as an identitarian backlash. Uh, so it's, it's a hard moment. It's a very sad moment that we have entered to a, an extraordinary backlash that we are like uh, experiencing some of different parts of the wars of our history in the same moment. But in the same time, we have the alternative right here. You know, this the, the the coronavirus outbreak in Brazil was extremely violent and unequal to indigenous and black people. 
uh, especially to indigenous people can certainly talk about as a genocide. But the, the, it also emerged a new process of resistance, very diverse forms of resistance. And most of the, the resistance in local communities were, were led and organized by women who were taking care of the community and of the territory and finding a traditional way to heal, uh, finding herbs, songs, sing, uh, how to mobilize shamanic power to protect the community to help the community face that moment and to keep the strength fighting to protect their, the, the, the possibility to reproduce the world. Uh, and I think we can engage in that. I believe that we can, as, as, as sometime very fast, a big part of the population just decided to vote for uh, fascist. I believe that we can dispute, dispute people and we must be, I believe that uh, humans, they can change ideas, you know, when you need to, I, I would say that the big struggle today is associated to ideas. Uh, so the situation you, you do described very well, it was already <clears throat> very serious before the pandemic, but really worse and worse than the pandemic. In your recent paper at the World Development makes a very nice uh, systematization of the, of the effects. And, and that paper is a, is a result of a, one of the products of a, of a research program you have on, on mapping uh, violence among indigenous communities. I wanted to hear more about that project, that research project. How, how is it to organize and who is funding it? And uh, how do you uh, get information from the communities? What kind of partnership you have established with indigenous communities for mapping violence in, in Brazil, which is it's a huge territory, it's a, it's a continent. So we are fully aware of the, of the difficulties associated with uh, doing research at certain, such a large scale. So, I mean, tell us more about it, uh, your project on mapping violence. Well, the first thing is that I, I do believe in multidisciplinary research, and I also believe in working in network. I don't believe that you can work alone today. Not, not in the past, but even today, we should work in network. We should work together uh, and, uh, and, 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 and work beyond the university. Uh, working together with what we call the objects in the past, and today we know that they are subject. So we should work together in, in the case of uh, investigating violence against indigenous people. Uh, uh, we have been working together with indigenous people uh, inside and outside of the university. Uh, this project is a network to build more networks. So we start, I started working with a friend from the University of Sussex. Uh, they, they inspire, that she's part, Mary Menton, that she's part of an organization that to have also tied hands uh, to fight violence against environmental defenders, which is not one more. And we, we started a project funded by the British Academy to listen to voices of environmental defenders risking their life to fight uh, against uh, sustainable development projects. And, and, and their experience telling about, how, about living in those atmospheres of terror or violence and how they could keep strength and mobilize community and working in a collective action to, to, to protect the life in a broad sense, as they say, not only the life of the river or of the forest, and, and during, uh, as, we were, as I was working with the subject of uh, environmental defenders, it appeared that the violence against indigenous people has been rising and rising. And Global Witness catch that in their latest report. Uh, one of the best things that happened during Lula government and Dilma government was not only the expansion of a federal university, but also different uh, affirmative action that opened the Brazilian universities to blacks and to indigenous students. And it, 
it turns out that in my university, there are more than 200 indigenous students. And in other universities in Bahia, the state that I'm working in, there are very, very beautiful groups of, uh, and collective of indigenous students. And in one of the universities, uh, there is one great indigenous scholar, Philippe Tuchau, which is also a good friend. So we had this chance to, to, to try to build a network in Bahia together with, the, uh, uh, with Sussex to map the, 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 through the methodology of political ecology and environmental justice, very much inspired by the, the work of Juan Martinez Allier and uh, the Atlas of Environmental Justice. Uh, I have uh, suggested to write about environmental conflicts in indigenous land and in indigenous territories with indigenous students. So the students would be writing about violence and would write about their people through the, the, the perspective of political ecology. Uh, we have been learning a lot with this, uh, this uh, new methodology, let's say, you know, that the writers of the, 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 the conflict would be the protagonists of those conflicts. Uh, it, it's not only that we decided to make invisible the conflicts by writing about them, but thinking together with those who are resisting. And during this process, it emerged, it, it, break, it, 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 it came the coronavirus crisis and the outbreak of COVID-19, and uh, indigenous territories were directly affected. So we turned the research to, to, to try to, to, to understand a bit better how uh, development projects and uh, extract, uh, extractive projects were build, you were bringing the pandemic to indigenous territories. The indigenous movements was do, were doing that. And with this network, uh, uh, we, we kept uh, the discussion everyday messaging, you no know, WhatsApp and other uh, app with the leaders of different communities and trying to understand their situation. First of all, trying to save lives, trying to raise funds and money to bring oxygen to the forest and no oxygen compressors and, 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 and the needs that, that the communities would need to survive. And with the, the students that were part of the project, the project, we invited them to write about and to reflect about the, 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 the relationship between the coronavirus and, and, and the economic pressure outside of the territories. Uh, so we were able to see the association of extraction and pandemic. And the pandemic mobilized as, as a, a conquest, as a machine as a war machine for the conquest for territories. Uh, Bolsonaro made that crystal clear in a meeting with ministers here when the Minister of the Environment, Salis, de uh, defines the, the pandemic as an opportunity, opportunity for, for, for changing the legal system, uh, uh, but also opportunity to, to conquer territories. So that I, I, I was reading this moment as, uh, as pandemic and war. But wars always have many ways to tell the resistance. You know? So uh, uh, we, we started to look for the resistance, not only for the diagnostic of the destruction and of the genocide. The first paper that I wrote about during the pandemic was notes of a genocide and how a genocide was pre being produced. But once we entered the genocide and we already see more than 800 indigenous uh, person killed by, by, by coronavirus, some amazing leaders like Payacan, Aritana, Zeite, all of them assassinated by coronavirus, then what, what, what is left? I mean, we still survive, we need to do something. And uh, we decided to make a shift and work with indigenous artists associated with indigenous intellectuals who are writing about the conflicts and the experience of the community. We also decided to work with the indigenous artists from these territories to discuss with them what would be the alternatives, what they, which, which way they were looking to, to move out of, of the situation. 
either from building memory of the knowledge of the ones who 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 were who who died during the crisis, mm -hmm. but well, alternative how they would uh, I don't know uh, keep this knowledge flowing to next generations uh, through orality and other forms of knowledge transmissions, but but what would be their dream? And there is an extraordinary indigenous intellectual in Brazil called Ailton Krenak. And during, uh, we have been discussing daily about the passing of many common friends, but then some of them find, found different ways to heal from the coronavirus, such as some Shavanti friends that using traditional roots, they were able to face COVID-19, survive it. Also, Raoni, Megaron, some Kaya leaders. And Ayuto told me and, uh, and, and wrote a beautiful poem and he sent me by WhatsApp. There was another sky. And so during such crisis like that, should never forget the beauties that the sky holds. And, and the sky is a very powerful uh, idea in shamanism. In, in, and it's a very shamanic uh, concept in, in, among uh, indigenous people and in Brazil, like how to hold the sky and how the sky can fall over our heads. And talking about sky, it's look, it seems like talking about new horizons. And so we started to investigate these new horizons. Uh, how can we look forward to something that would mobilize us to resist, to fight and to transform this situation? Uh, so at the same time that we're documenting destruction, we're trying to look and we write about that in this paper, the different forms of resisting that, mob that indigenous people mobilize during the crisis. And, and something that I found in common talking to many indigenous friends, such as uh, the great leader Sonia Guajajara as well, is that in every time during the worst moment, they were always thinking that they would defeat Bolsonaro, that they're going to defeat their enemies. And, and they don't think about moving to somewhere else. We cannot say, oh, if Bolsonaro takes me out of the university or, or started to persecute me, I don't know, I'm going to go to France for exile. This is, this is, just a, this is a white man's mind. You know? it, doesn't, it doesn't touch indigenous people. It doesn't touch the blacks in Brazil. There's no other way to go. This is our place. It's like a jaguar inside a cave, inside uh, one place that when the jaguar is under attack, they, they're going to react. And they react strongly in many smart ways, occupying social media, coming to the press, producing their own data against the, 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 the data that the government were hide, hiding. And, and it, it, it becomes an intense and beautiful process. And we try to have that in, the, in this paper as well, you know. So how through political ecology, we could see how coronavirus uh, spread all of indigenous territories being mobilized, such as a, a war machine in a conquest, in a war of conquest, but how they found out different forms to resist it. Very engaged one, which can inspire, can inspire resistance much outside of indigenous territories and other cultures. And this, I think the political creativity of indigenous people should all look to it, you know, that this is, this is a form, this is the only way that I believe that we can really change this, this sad process that we're facing in Brazil and US and, and in Europe as well, you know, with uh, the rising of uh, fascism in Hungary and in France and many countries. You know, it's looking to how political, how indigenous people discuss daily politics. You know, every day they're talking about politics, how they are talking about the future, future generation, the territories, the economic subsistence, you know, new way to look to economy, new way to look to politics. You know, we need, need to move out of the uh, Eurocentric view that forms our view, you know, to find out new other views of the world and how we can inspire and mobilize other 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 skies. 
Yeah, it's nice to talk about errors in treatment because the, the Brazilian academia is has been always very much Eurocentric. Yeah? And, uh, and, you, and yourself, I, I, I think you have a, a European background, uh, uh, both, I mean, uh, phenotypically and also in, the, in your training as uh, you have a PhD in, uh, in England eh, from a British university. No, worse, in the University of Portugal, <laughs> which was the University of the Colonization. <laughs> But it's one great university today to discuss the coloniality of power and, yeah. and the colonization of knowledge. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to talk to you about this specific issue of, of, of um, I mean, political ecology is, is, is a field that has been mainly developed in Europe. I mean, like, like a theoretical background as, as business in general, the, the theoretical background of, of sociology and all most social sciences. Uh, the authors we read are mainly white men from Europe uh, and the classical authors. And, um, my question is how what, how that uh, how do you think uh, um, that has affected your practice as a researcher, and to what extent you have to change that framing for dealing with uh, indigenous communities in Brazil. And more specifically, what, what do you think are the main uh, limitations of the, let's say, European social sciences when dealing with uh, communities in other parts of the world, which have a completely way of you know, of uh, being in the world, but also of a way of knowing the world, completely different knowledge systems uh, that sometimes is compatible, but many times it's not really compatible with Eurocentric visions. So my question is, how, how do you struggle with your theoretical categories and with your background as a you know, uh, as an academician with all these uh, uh, European theoretical uh, frameworks behind you, a long history of the social sciences uh, associated to European authors. That's a great question, Huda. And you know, I think a lot about it, like almost every day, uh, being a white researcher in Bahia, which is a, a black, a state in Brazil where the majority of the, the population is black, maybe 80%. I think in Salvador should be around 80 or 90%. And, um, and, and coming from South Brazil as well and having studied in Europe, uh, and many times I'm confronted to position myself and, and, uh, and to do my work and to do my research, I need to position myself so I to understand how, what, what I, how am I looking to things and, and how can I understand things and how can I spread uh, those ideas? Uh, one thing first concerning to political ecology, there is a great shaman uh, in Brazil called Davi Kopenawa. He, he wrote an amazing book called The Falling Sky. There is one part that Davi defines ecology. And, and he says that uh, if they would have written words, ecology would be one of the oldest words in the Yanomami vocabulary, more than a thousand years. Uh, it's much older than to the whites, he says, you know. But now the whites has just learned that the ecology is important and they are saying that they are the people of the ecology. But David disagrees with that. He says that they are ecology, because in their way, in that knowledge, in that way to see the world, ecology is the forest, but it's also the sky, the wind, the spirits, which are the, the shapiri, everything that's away from the fences, everything that is away from the whites. That's how he defines ecology. And he defines the Yanomami as the people of the ecology. 
And, and ecology is a word that for the Yanomami would have been made and created by Omama when Omama created the word a long time ago. So it would be seen as a, a very old word. And very recently, the whites are reclaiming that they are the people of the college, and he denies that, you know. And I find very interesting that he he separates the the word and what it means that concept, you know. When I went to study political ecology in a European network of political ecology and title, so I was based in Coimbra, but having. Uh, being part of a very interesting group in Barcelona with Joan. And uh, I had three supervisors, Stefania Barca, my main supervisor, a is a feminist uh, Italian historian and economic researcher, a wonderful woman who taught me a lot. And uh, I also had classes and part of my PhD was done in Manchester and in Lund and I was circulating in Europe. And, and learning how, uh, and learning political ecology, I found out that I was doing political ecology before going to study political ecology. I was doing political ecology in the way that I was working as journalist. I was very, uh, looking to political ecology, not only as a, as a scientific field, of an interdisciplinary scientific field, but also a community of practice uh, and how to engage in, in, in struggle and, and looking to environmental conflicts as something part of the, the system and part of the problem and not the problem to be, the, uh, to find a solution to end the conflict, you know, but look into conflict as, as resistance to, 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 to achieve new rights and, uh, and justice. Uh, so I was doing political ecology before in another way. That's how I find somehow, you know, uh, but having the, what, what, what was very interesting in Europe was to having the freedom to research. And, and the freedom of the interdisciplinary research, because one thing is zero, the other thing is Eurocentrism. And sometimes the Brazilian academia can be much more Eurocentric than an university in Europe, who are trying to find new ways to, to dialogue with the world. So I believe that most of Brazilian universities are more Eurocentric than the University of Coimbra, where I was working, SAS, or uh, the University of Manchester, which is a wonderful university. Or the ICTA in Barcelona, who tries to dialogue with alternatives to capitalism much more than most of the Brazilian economic <laughs> universities, you know. Uh, so I mean, Eurocentrism is not—it's not in Europe. It's outside. It's something that's inside our mind as well. Uh, and in studying in Europe and understanding better the situation of, of Europe allowed me when to 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 develop a more sense of myself as European descendant in Brazil, and to understand that I was thinking that was Europe, maybe it was different from what it re Europe really is. So I was able to understand Europe, understand Eurocentrism, and try to build something different in Brazil. So when I came back and I had the chance to enter the, a decolonial academia in Brazil, having a decolonial position as, pro, as a professorship position in Bahia, I was already prepared and I was prepared before going to Europe, but I developed that in my European experience to, to listen more the black and the indigenous students, to listen to them, their ideas, to work with their ideas uh, as a theoretical ideas. I learned that in Coimbra more than here. I, maybe I would not have the chance to think like that if I would be studying anthropology in Brazil. It's, it's still a much more Eurocentric and colonial academic field than an interdisciplinary field in, in, in Europe, for example, you know. So I was prepared to listen and I was, and I prepared myself to listen and to pay attention to anti-racist movements, to pay attention to, uh, uh, to feminist theoretical framework. Uh, and I was prepared to come to an university and work in a decolonial way in the university. To, to, to build networks such as uh, from uh, uh, this paper that has just been published by uh, at the World Development, where the majority of the researchers are uh, are indigenous students, not, not, not in the paper. In the paper, one of the, the authors is an indigenous scholar, but in the project that we have not finished yet, we are, we are finished, but working together with indigenous people uh, in, inside the academia, I learned that in Europe. Because some European universities that I had the chance to be there, 
they were already trying to find this way. But Europe is isolated from most of the world. You know? Unfortunately, Europeans and, 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 set, and set like the British, they live in an island in a very far away place. And it's hard to, to, to exchange because it's far away from the rest of the world where they would, that they had, their, their ancestors have invaded and, and destroyed, but then do they want to dialogue? But it's very far and it's very expensive. And it turned that in Brazil, it, it would be easier to find that this way. It would be easier to invite indigenous uh, intellectuals to come to university and, and Colombo leaders and, uh, and Candomblé uh, leaders as well. So it, it, it has mobilized me to see university as a lab, laboratory of resistance. Uh, but being white and a man, a heterosexual from, from South Brazil, Gaucho, uh, uh, during this uh, uh, very aggressive moment of white patriarchalism in Brazil, maybe we're living one of the worst moments, it makes the situation really hard because we need to fight against uh, white supremacy. We need to fight against branquitude, as we call it here. Uh, we need to fight against all this racist privilege and, and sexist privilege here. And we as the white, we need to do that. We need to fight together to find a common, a common grounds, common, uh, uh, what, what, what put us together, you know, our common uh, views, what, what we can share that we need to share the world. And I think this is really important. I'm very happy that I'm able to work with anti-racist research projects associated with the University of Manchester, for example, and another network, or working with political ecology together with indigenous and black students. Uh, we, are, we have, uh, I, I'm developing a project in the University of Bahia, which is named Anti-Racist Ecologist in Bahia. So we try to look to ecologists that are build a social process which are anti-racist, such as the demarcation of indigenous land, the landscape, the art, uh, how the art craft and the artwork and the songs that position this group uh, uh, and this landscape together against the monocultural landscape, such as uh, eucalyptus and all this uh, uh, racist economy. Uh, and, and we are able to dialogue. And I think this is so beautiful, you know. There's no other way to decentralize political ecology, to, to build an anti-Eurocentric worldview, and new forms of production of knowledge and new scientific methodologies without a lot of dialogue, without listening a lot to other experiences and working with experience. And I, I'm, I'm happy to be in the Bahia to do that. I couldn't find any better place in the world to work after having an European experience than in Bahia. So I was trained in Europe that uh, provided me tools that I'm developing here. Uh, but this is an ongoing process. Everyday process we need to discuss ourselves, discuss what we're doing. And this means a lot of a lot of anxiety and a lot of struggle as well, Hold on, because I'm not dissociating my activist work, my militant work, my responsibility to save the life that I can save life during this crisis, that I can help to raise funds for a community who are in desperate situation for the coronavirus. I don't, I, I don't separate that with research. And I, I think we cannot do that. You need to have responsibility to our research. It means if we're working with indigenous people, if we're working against racism, we need to be anti-racist every, every moment. You know, it's not, it's not only writing an, a paper with anti-racist words. It means our daily practices, and I try to do that. Uh, it's, it's hard. Uh, but it's, it's the only, it's, it's the best way to position ourselves today to live this world without getting depressed or without getting, I don't know, uh, trying to find a way to, to escape, you know, uh, like, like they are doing in California, you know, trying to go to other planets. I don't want to go to other planets. I want to stay at this planet here, you know, 
And to stay in this planet, we need to be anti-racist and sexist and anti-capitalist and, and, and learn new ways to live with, the, with nature. That's the only way. It's the only way possible. And life goes fast. So I try to start that early. I think it's very nice that you, you also have a background in journalism and, um, and you also script a uh, writer, if I'm not mistaken, uh, written a couple of um, documentaries. And, um, so, because I think that a, a key challenge now is, is, is a challenge of communication. Um, because it, the discourse has changed so radically in uh, the official discourse. Yeah? So for people that are not familiar with Brazil, I mean, <clears throat> just to give you a few examples, the, the Ministry of Women in Brazil is, is, has declared herself as anti-feminist. Yeah? Or the, the, the Ministry of the Environment has declared, has uh, declared um, that Greenpeace and other environmental NGOs are terrorist organizations or uh, the person in charge of the Palmares Foundation, it's a, a federal foundation in charge of promotion of the uh, African-Brazilian African uh, culture is against the black movement. So just to give an examples that to people that are not familiar with the Brazil about what, what is really going on. And how's that this change of government has also changed radically the official discourse. Uh, the official discourse now in Brazil is anti, anti-environment, anti anti-mobilization um, and, and social movements, including feminism and, and the black movement. So um, and that's that's the why the, the challenge of communication has become so important. Uh, and, and, and the big issue is, I don't have the answer. That's a question, probably our my last uh, question for you: uh, is how to communicate communicate with the other side. And you started this interview saying that, that Bolsonaro is not alone. He's really supported, but considerable considerable share of the population, consider a proportion of the population. And that support has paradoxically, <clears throat> despite what all you have said, <clears throat> increased during the pandemic, which is a phenomenon very really difficult to explain. Uh, uh, if you look at the number of death in Brazil, it's, uh, it's the second country in the, in the world, the number of death. Um, but, Bolsonaro popularity has increased in the pandemic. So the, that, that shows that uh, it's, it's a big challenge how to communicate with the other side, you know? uh, because people that are they already agree with you and they will agree more with you. <laughs> uh, but what about people that, um, that, that are on the other side? This because this. Polarization in Brazil has become very severe, as, 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 as it is the case in, in the US and in Poland and many other parts of the world where, um, where there exists the same phenomenon from Hungary. There is the rise of extreme right wing. Really, we have experienced a very big polarization of the population, and this is increasingly difficult to, to listen to each other because. Especially if you come from the Caribbean, because the official discourse is also anti intellectual, anti science. Uh, and so, that, the generic question I pose to you is uh, how to deal with that, how to communicate uh, with people that normally will never read you, or with your cousins, with your uh, people that do not agree with you, uh, that do not share your worldview. But that vote, and they act after all, they decide uh, the future of Brazil. Uh, so, uh, as your experience as journalist probably can give us some hints about <laughs> this communication challenge. Well, first thing that 
I would say is that negationism is something really serious. And how negationism has come all over the world, it has definitely changed uh, politics and, and everything else. The denial of science, you know, Bolsonaro has been denying uh, satellites. He says that satellites are not taking serious images in the Amazon. I mean, denying anything, you know, and using fake news. That is not something new, you know, fake news is racism in Brazil and it has been mobilized for years and years. But negation is, uh, and the denying, the denial of science is something new that that people in academia, they were not able, they were not prepared to face it. And they, 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 until today, they don't know how to deal with that. Suddenly we are all in Twitter and you have like few, few words to say something. And, and everybody has the same, you know, and then you can bring something like, I wrote a paper about that and someone can just reply to you and say, well, my opinion is different. <laughs> But how come your opinion is different? Well, the Amazon is burning. Well, that's your opinion. My opinion is different. I mean, can't you see that you cannot even see the sky because of the, 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 the <laughs> because of the smoke? And, and uh, it's satellite images. But then, I don't know, the vice president can say that, well, I just flew over that and it was rocks, it was not fire. So my opinion is different. And then comes something, opinion, that to us has always been important, you know, having your opinion on something, that's important. But then it was turned that my opinion is something different. And, and then we are stuck on, it's a problem of communication, maybe, because you have been writing in scientific papers that very few can understand. And then as the rest of people would not understand that, they'd say, well, I'm against that because I, I prefer I trust Trump, I trust Bolsonaro, because it's easy what they say, you know, and it works better in negationism, you know, I mean, I, we don't want to, we, we don't, we don't want to look to, we, we don't want to discuss seriously what's happening, because that's really sad, and maybe the whole humanity will not be here in a hundred years or two hundred years, you know, uh, how, how, the, how the planet will rebuild itself after three or four degrees more, you know, what, what's going to happen? And it's hard to, 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 to take that seriously. So it's much easier to say, oh, that's bullshit, you know? Let's just keep extracting and improving. Oh, that's, a, that's the communists. Who are the communists? The Chinese? Oh, come on, they're not communists. You know? The Russians, come on, they're not communists. They're of the new czar. But the communists, they made up that. Or that's indigenous inventions. It, it's easier. It's good. People feel good in that. And it's, it's very unfair how it came up, but then we realize that scientists, they, has, they have been extremely arrogant. Uh, and, 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 and that led also to this crisis, you know. Uh, arrogance, they were arrogant, privileged. They could have like the best conditions of work while the rest of the society would be like in Brazil a society of poor people and, uh, and, and we're, we're not facing the problems of the society. We're not trying to dialogue. It's, it's not something like uh, communication of scientific work. It's not something like let's communicate to them. I mean, we need to be informing society. That's extremely, that's, that's as important as produced knowledge is to inform knowledge that's produced. Otherwise we're building that for what, for what reason, you know? for careers, only careers, publishing papers for careers. I have been publishing a lot in this year, but I've been published because it's important to tell the story of Megaron Chukahama. It's important to tell the story of the resistance. That, that, that was mobilized me to change that. But other sense was just building papers for building papers, writing papers, writing papers, publish or, publish or die. Uh, otherwise your career, so the science has become center of the person of, of individual careers. That, that's Eurocentrism, that's coloniality, pure coloniality, you know. The, the career, the European careers, the North, the, the North careers, and that they're trying to build careers here, but then here in South America it didn't work well because the students are poor, the society is poor, so the career would be like 
uh, building a castle outside of the rest of the, the society. Here, for a long time, it, it did not work, this type of science, let's say, you know. Paulo Freire showed, showed that long time ago. We have Milton Santos, we have a history of engaged scholars, such as Marxists as well in Europe. You know, they, they are engaged in produce knowledge and change society. That's the only way that science is important. Even though here in Brazil, we still have, especially in humanities and other social science that I, I, I'm more close to, uh, the privileged scientists in the in southern institutions they believe that they can they must have the privilege to think freely while the world is burning they we can think far away from social movements i mean how do you see so we cannot think far away from social movements we need to think together with movements who are changing society the society is like is burning is melting how can we going to think to 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 that's extremely elitist, and, and science has been elitist. So we need to criticize science. We need to, we need to understand that science was behind, uh, especially in economic, was behind in all this destruction of the world, how this uh, science justify racism, justify inequality. That was science. And then we, we have the negationism of satellites, of fire, of everything else. And we're stuck in this position, what, what to do now? You know, uh, having the experience as working, for working as journalists, uh, I learned a lot the importance of communicating, of telling stories and of listening stories. And I learned a lot working with indigenous people that we would need to go to the village and stay hours and hours listening to them. Like sometimes 20 in indigenous village would mean to stay five hours in the center of the village, listen, explain yourself what you're doing there, and listen and listen and listen and listen a lot. And that we would be friends, become friends, and I would understand a bit more the struggle and say a few days there, and then writing about that in a very respectful way. So listen a lot and try to transform orality to a written world. And listen and paying attention to the power of orality. When I try to bring that to academic institutions, especially in Brazil in the beginning. I didn't have any space to that. I didn't have any chance. That was absolutely disconsidered. I mean, you listen to many stories, but then that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean anything. This is the real knowledge here. Take these few books of white male Europeans. You know, and that's, the, it's, it, uh, when you visit the villages, were you like backed by Bourdieu methodology or something? I mean, otherwise it doesn't count. And we come to this point that there's different ways to produce knowledge, as I was explained before, you know, working together with indigenous students, scholars, intellectuals, but also how to tell that. And I have learned that, that, how, that it's a great pleasure to take pictures and show pictures. It's a, it's a pleasure to me to be able, it's a privilege as well, to be able to do documentaries. So I have done few documents. I have, uh, screenwriting documentaries. I have worked for a screenwriter also for documentaries. But I have also raised funds to help indigenous people to do the documentaries. I have been doing more than actually than doing documentary myself. So part of this latest project, uh, we raised funds with the University of Sussex and we invited a couple of two brilliant indigenous filmmakers, Alexandre de Pancararu, and Grassi Guarani. So they are doing a film about the effect of coronavirus in their territories. And I think this is so beautiful. And I want to help that. And I think that's part of the university to help this innovation uh, of telling stories and of producing knowledge to spread in society. I don't believe that global television or Netflix will help indigenous filmmakers to do something. But in the university, we can do that. We're able to do it and we're able to, to legitimize this knowledge. And, and this is something that, this is a way to position ourselves in this world melting of fake news and, and the negationism, to learn these stories, to, to use the, the, the ideas of David Kopenawa and Ayutthaya Karanak in class, to circulate this experience and, and to help them to produce knowledge and produce together university. Uh, has to, to transform university into pluriversity, to have to be more plural 
uh, it's not an easy uh, movement. Uh, and we need, but it, it, we need to discuss among colleagues in the university and to trust each other that this is a way possible to produce, to do serious work, scientific work, uh, listen and telling in many other ways. I mean, it's not only papers in journal that counts, there are many other forms to express our experience and our knowledge that counts, that should count and should be respected. Journalists should be respected and they are seriously done as well. And uh, having a background in journalists was, was good to me among some European partners, such as Juan Martinez Alier, he does respect a lot the work of journalists. Our, my, my supervisor is Stefania Bark, and I had, I, I had a John O'Neill at the University of Manchester as, as well. But in Brazil, very often, anything that I say uh, is discredited because I have a background in journalists. Oh, he's being superficial, you know, he's, he's just a journalist and he doesn't know what he's writing about. Uh, there's uh, many, form, many ways that scientific knowledge is, uh, is using colonial tools to, hierarchy, to make a hierarchy of knowledge, what is worth, what is not worth, what you should take down and what you should uh, respect and uh, how to organize that. You know, it's, it's the same way that Trump and Bolsonaro are doing. It's the same way you're saying, uh, my opinion is different from yours and without respecting and, and, and try to build more dialogues, be more open to the needs of society. So having a committee, a, a, a public uh, community engaged uh, university and produce a new science, uh, that is embedded in the world, that is dialoguing to other forms of knowledge produ production, respecting orality, respecting others' experience and the dialogues. I, I believe that this, this is necessary, not only to Europe, to, but to everywhere, everywhere in the world, not to build a neurocentric uh, science, but to build a new knowledge that will help us to review our society and to be prepared to rebuild the world after Trump, after Bolsonaro, and after capitalism. Because it's going to be a tough task in the future. You know, I, I, we, are in a, we are a privileged generation. But what we're doing to the future generation is something unhuman. Well, thank you very much, uh, Felipe. I'm very grateful to you. And, um, uh, I think you are doing a wonderful uh, job and uh, we are very proud of your work, work here in Brazil. And um, yeah, I think you are setting a, a very interesting trend of, of collaboration and humility of, you know, of uh, academia in relation to other forms of knowledge. And uh, I think that's extremely important, especially in this part of the world, for the whole world. But, uh, especially in Brazil, this is a pity that it's a, it's a novelty because we should have uh, taken that path a long time ago. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, uh, it's a novelty that it's kind always, of uh, approaches. You know? <laughs> it's always time to do it, you know? Yeah. As soon as we can change, yeah. it's better. Yeah. So thank you very much, Felipe. And then, uh, I've enjoyed a lot in this interview, uh, also the people that will uh, watch this interview on the, the YouTube channel of the International Society also will enjoy it. Um, and that's one of the main, uh, you know, has been always a core concern of ecological economics since the beginning, how to establish these bridges, not only with other disciplines, but also with other worldviews, other forms of, of, of knowledge. So thanks again. And uh, to all the people that are assisted to, to, to watch this uh, video until the end. <laughs> and I hope uh, we can uh, talk to you soon.